we can play knight c6, and now at this point, let's say we play h3, which is not a good move, take on f3, we take back with the bishop, we hang this pawn, we take back with the pawn, and we're going to go e5 break. This week's one that I did, um, last week's studies was on middle game piece play, so what to do with your pieces, your rook, your queen, your knights, your bishops. So the piece that I didn't really cover was pawns, because uh, pawns is a whole different ball game when it comes to the middle game. So there's a famous player from the past, Philidor, who said pawns are the soul of chess. So your pawn structure uh, determines how the rest of your pieces will play. So it's uh, quite a lengthy concept to go through uh, in chess. Okay, so can everyone see the study? If you can't, it's in the Nomad channel. I, I will share it there. You can just ping me if you don't see it in the Nomad channel. Okay, so the first image you see here is uh, the chessboard. So the chessboard is divided into five sections. The king side for white and black, the queen side for white and black, and then the four center squares that interlock between those. If you can see here, I drew arrows to make it quite apparent. So, the reason the board is divided into these four sections is because um, you play on the side of the board, you have more space. So, in the start, we aim for space in the center. Uh, this is where our pieces will get the most mobility, and then we can claim space wherever we want. Um, after that, normally we have claim to one side of the board, and then say we have more space on the queen side, then we play on the queen side. I have more space in the king, so I play on the king side. So I'm going to give a brief e explanation to opening principles so you guys can understand. So in the opening, we aim to control the center. So after the move e4, if black doesn't stop me from playing d4, I'm going to play d4. That's why the, no the two most common responses are e5, to prevent d4 and c5 to prevent d4. e5 is the open game, c5 is the Sicilian. Just opening name. So there are there are two ways to play the opening. Uh, welcome Salty Chess. Welcome Salty Chess. Click on the study in the Nomad channel. You can post your questions, so just type our uh, answers in Nomad channel and the early chess study I shared. I should make it open for everyone to chat. So, uh, okay, it's fine. So, yeah. So, this aims to control um, the d4 square. So, what if uh, black wants to control the light squares? So that means black's going to give up control over the dark squares. So they play something like c6 or e6. Then white, because now he's given the option, he's going to grab the space. Now he has two pawns in the center and controls the dark squares as well. Black plays e5 and control, uh, aims to control the light squares. Similar with c6 gives up the dark square control, aims to control the light squares. So, the move d5, this move um, is currently called the Scandinavian defense. But in the olden times, it was called the center counter game. You want to, uh, to understand why, this is the most direct control against the e4 point. So I'm going to go more into depth uh, into that for a second so you guys can understand. So there's two ways to play uh, the opening, like I said earlier. One is you aim to control your own space in the opening. So white has a pawn in e4 and black has a pawn in e5, and you defend your space. So I have central control of the dark squares, I have central control of the light squares. So white and black defends their space. And then uh, we challenge each other to get opposite space. The move c5, uh, which controls the d4 pawn. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just going to get back into that in a second. 
Okay, so the move D, I'm going to go over the move D4 now so you guys can understand. So the move D4, after the move D4, you are threatening to go E4. So the main two responses after D4 are knight F6, stopping E4, and D5, stopping E4. Any other response, and you are giving white the center. So like I said, the classical way of playing was to keep control of the space and uh, defend your space. Then, um, hundreds of years ago, there was a term called the hypermodern style of chess. What the hypermodern style of chess means is you give your opponent the center and then you attack it later. So a move like knight f6 here, the alakine or aliokin defense. Now, black has not put any pawns in the center. They're not aiming to control space. They are directly attacking the opponent's space. e5, knight d5, d4. And now that we've given our opponent space, now we start uh, counter-attacking. That's why the move d6. Next move. So we start attacking our opponent's space. C4, knight b6, takes, takes knight c3. I'm just going through the moves here quickly so I can just get to a point. So white has more space because he has a pawn more forward in the center, but at the same time he has to defend his space while black's trying to put all his pressure to attack it. G7, knight comes here. Bishop comes here to remove the defender of the d4 point. So I'm just going to show you the move here. Bishop e2 here. Okay, so now already the move castle would be a mistake. We can play knight c6, and now at this point, let's say we play h3, which is not a good move. Take on f3. If we take back with the bishop, we hang this pawn. Take back with the pawn, then we're going to go e5 break. It's going to take advantage of this weakened structure. So yeah, so just remember, there's two styles. One, you have your space in the center that you try to defend, and then the hypermon style was you give your opponent space, but you attack his space later. So I just want to show you another opening so you guys can understand. After d4. Knight f6, c4. The main moves here are e6, and then say knight c3, and then either d5 or bishop b4. Black is supporting his space advantage in the center. What if we play d5 right away? What do you guys think of this move? Maybe you can comment on it in the No Mic channel. What do you guys think of this move? Okay, so yeah. So this move, because you're not supporting your center, now black can take, white can take. And then after we take back, play knight f3, g6, e4, knight b6. We now have two pawns in the center. So we have the space. But again, the hypermon style of chess. Black has given up the center, but black is going to attack the center later. Um, just to cover, why I didn't play e4 on this move? Okay, so, sorry, what I was covering is why I played knight f3 instead of e4 is because if, if I go e4 right away, he goes knight f6, attacking the e4 point. If I defend with knight c3, he goes e5, breaking the e, uh, my pawn. If I take, he exchanges queens, plays knight g5, attacking these two points. So, because I don't want to allow this e5 break, I play knight f3 first. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly say again, because Cotton joined a bit late. So, in the opening, 
you are doing one of two things. One, you are trying to control your space. So you say I play e4, e5, knight 3 So we have our space advantage now on the dark squares. And then we defend the space advantage we have. We can do it with c6 as well. Then we aim to control the central light squares. Uh, just briefly back on this opening. This opening is currently called the Scandinavian, but like I said before, it used to be called the center counter game because this was most, the most direct way to attack against the e4 point. Notice we're not preparing d5 with c6 or e6. We're directly counter attacking with d5. So by the way, all the moves that aren't c5, c6, e6, c e5, or d5, all the other moves are counted as hypermodern, would be the hypermodern style. Knight f6, d6, b6, g6. You uh, you give your opponent the center, and you're going to attack it later. OK, so this was just an intro to uh, basically expand your knowledge about why the opening principles are the opening principles. We defend our center, or we attack it later. Um, I'm not going over the other things where you say knights before bishops. Those are just general rules. All the openings go around um, controlling the center or attacking the center later. Uh, one thing I want to briefly add here is regarding the Sicilian. OK, um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Let me just go here. So this is a center pawn, the d4 and the uh, the the E and D pawn are the center pawns for both black and white. When black played D5, he's exchanging one of his center pawns for our wing pawn. When you hear someone refer to the wing, it means everything but the center pawns. So these are the wings of, of the chessboard. The F, the G, the H, the A, the B, the C. Those are all the wing. So when you trade the wing pawn for the center pawn, uh, because we have less pawns in the center, now we have given up more um our opponent more space to push his center and have more uh have more space have more central control so if i go back to the sicilian there's an opening called the open sicilian which goes like this we have given up our center pawn d4 for our opponent's wing pawn on c5 what we have gotten in exchange for that is a more forward pawn on e4. So we have more space because we have the most furthest advanced central pawn, but we have less pawns, uh, less pawns in the center. So that's why a lot of times people refer to the Cillian as you lose quickly or you win slowly because you have an extra center pawn. You normally have an endgame advantage in a lot of uh, positions in the Sicilian. So, knight f6 here. Just playing a few moves here. Okay, so here we play e5. The reason we play e5 is because we want to consolidate one of the pawns so we can just prepare the d5 break. The moment we get in the d5 break, we exchange the e pawn for our d pawn. So we've removed, um, and then we're the only one with the center pawn left on e5. So we are the one which will have more space as black. That's why uh, this is the most popular response. Makes it easier to get in d5. OK, um, before I move over to the next part, which is on pawn structures, you guys have any questions? OK, there was two questions. Uh, no e4 against temple after capture, recapture with 9. It's playable move, I guess. Are there openings where white don't play for center? I'll, yeah, you can do that in reverse, so I'll show you that. So, so this is called d3. I'm going to show you an opening called the King's Indian Attack. So it's going to work similar to you give your opponent the center, but now I'm giving it up as white. But in turn, I'm going to attack the center later. So I gave my opponent the center space, but now I counterattack with e4 later. I've given my opponent the center, 
And now I'm going to aim to control the light switch. Are there openings where, yeah, so this was an example. You can play a C4 and move one. This is called the English. So C4 is to delay any center moves and then uh, to take, take advantage of exchanging for one of the center pawns. Uh, is D3, yeah, D3 is more uncommon. It's even referred to being as a bit black, better or black. Uh, that's why the classical approach is so common today. You aim to control the center with pawns because if you if you counterattack the center, you fail to win a pawn or you fail to get compensation for it. Usually the side with the extra extra space just pushes you over. So that's why it's a more common approach to just defend your space. But I wouldn't say it's really inferior. Uh, engines today have told us that there is no bad opening. But uh, as long as you understand the two approaches, defend your space or attack your opponent's space, that's just the key. Welcome EA, um, the study is in the no mic channel. Uh, so bomb, <laughs> bomb cloud is not a good opening. I'm not going to say that in the lecture, it's not a good opening. Um, you can play the bomb cloud versus someone who is much lower rated than you, and then you get practice in um, uh, king safety. So. Um, I'm not going to advertise the bomb cloud, but I'll show you this briefly. So when you play this, you're playing from a disadvantage on move two already. So your opponent can start attacking you. But the advantage is now you're going to get practice defending your king. So if you can defend your king when it's already out on the board on move two, um, you should improve your chess overall, because now you're going to get practice with king safety. Um, if you're going to practice, I would recommend uh, this other opening. I'm not going to say the name of this opening. Uh, but you go, uh, you go d3, and then you go king d2, and then uh, your king's moved out and move two, and then uh, uh, if it gets attacked, you get uh, practice with how to just solidify and defend for the rest of the game. But uh, I would definitely not recommend the bomb clan. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on. Have, okay, it's fine, Cotton. Uh, Cotton is saying, apologies for train late. I'm still at work. I have to go home right now, so I can't stick around, unfortunately. I just wanted to check out what the ping was for. A pretty familiar accent. I hope there will be more of these in the future. Oh, yeah, Cotton, I think, is also from South Africa. Do I actually have a South African accent? I wonder. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to pawn structure. So now in the opening, there aren't too many, but there's a couple different pawn structures you can get into. So I'm going to just briefly go over one. So um, let me, I'm just thinking what one to show you guys. Okay, yeah, let me show you this one. This one, this one, this one. Okay, so when you study your opening, uh, just when you guys are going to study by yourself. I'm not going to go over um, repertoire yet, but um, it's important to understand one, where's the welcome to Silverbyte. Uh, study in the uh, Nomic channel. I can always repost it if you want. Here you go. Okay, so like I was saying, when you guys study openings by yourself, there are two things to understand. One, which side of the board you're going to be playing in your opening, and two, the key break moves in your opening. So I'm going to go over break moves later so you guys can understand more. But um, in this opening structure, this is called the advanced with the e5 point. White, white is going to play on the king's side because he has more space thanks to the e5 pawn, and black's going to play on the queen's side because he has more space thanks to the d5 point. So the moves are going to go c5, f4, f5 later. It's a simplistic approach, but it's important to understand the side you have more space is the side you are playing. So uh, this is just a picture of the previous position without pieces, so you can understand better. 
Okay, uh, just wanna see here. Okay, so now I'm just gonna show you a brief opening so you can see it. Uh, more detail about how space advantage is split up and which side you're fighting. Okay, if you're wondering, uh, the King's Indian defense is actually referred to as one of the hypermodern openings. So you have given your opponent the center, but then you counterattack with e5 later. But um, not getting into that, just get into this. So, like I said, one of the key things to understand is the break moves in the opening you're playing and which side of the board you're playing. So black plays this break move e5. And now, black's pawns form a chain. This chain forms an error. This says black's going to be playing on the king side. He's further advanced pawns also on the on e5, so that's the side of the board he's going to be playing. So castle, knight c6, d5, knight e7. So, I can briefly show you an example game, but I'm just going to explain. So, white's going to be playing on the queen side, black's going to be playing on the king side. One, black must know their key break move, their key break move is f5. White must know their key break move, c5. Two, they must know how they're going to arrange their pieces so they're going to continue on with their attack. So, I'm just going to briefly show some move. B4 to support the C5 move. Knight H5. Give wait, I don't want to play Knight H5. Because Knight H5 is going to be complicated. Uh, let me play Knight E8. Knight E8 to bring way for F5. C5 break. F5 break. So now we play Knight D2. Who knows why we play Knight D2? It's got two reasons. And can answer, why do we play knight d2? 3 to the pawn 5, 3, yeah, that's a good reason. Is there another reason we play knight d2? Knight b3, okay, not knight b3, but uh, at least you're pointing in the right direction. Okay, so like I said earlier, we play on the side of the board we have more space. Thanks to the d5 pawn, white has more space in the center and on the queen side. So we play knight d2 to play this move knight c4 later, so we can further put our pieces to supporting our play on the queen side. Knight c4 also pressurizes this key d6 point, so we can later take, play knight b5, and attack a weakness on d6. That's one of the main reasons why it's played, and it's also to push, uh, move it out the way to play f3 or support the e4 pawn. Yes, good points. So after knight f6, we play f3. Now after f4, the center has been closed off. Uh, remember I said there's the center and the wings. When the center is closed off, the play has to be on the wings. The wings is everything but the center, so this is the center, and everything else is the wing. So now that the center is locked, there's no more play in the center, everything's going to be on the wings. So the move knight c4. Remember I said uh, the knight's a bit better on c4 compared to b3. Uh, sorry, the knight's better on c4 compared to b3, because the knight on c4 supports this d6 point, and it's a bit further advanced. I'm going to get more into the last three chapters about scope and um, initial, uh, sorry, scope and influence so you guys can understand why you put your pieces on a more forward pose okay so now both sides continue attacking on the side of the board there more space g5 a4 knight g6 we have more space on the king side we attack on the king side yes bishop a4 uh, a3 sorry supporting this d6 point remember that was the weakness Rook f7, uh, rook f7 to, uh, to both maybe maneuver on the king's side and to defend some things along this rank, along the 7th rank here. b5, b4, 
gets this pawn away to put more pressure along this diagonal for the bishop. So now we take, because there was a threat to win the pawn here. Bishop takes. You know, h5, so we expand. a4, g4, b6, g3. Okay, now, from this position, uh, white has won some games, black has won some games, and there's been a few draws. Um, I'll show you a win from black. Oops, sorry, no, h3. So I'll show you a win from black here. Let me see. Okay, so knight b5 to put more pressure on this side. And now we show the king's side attack. Queen h4. Bishop g1. Defend h3. Bishop h3. Wants to take on g2. And then... Um, bring the knight in and check on h3. So, takes... Takes, written in g2. If you move the, it's g2 checkmate, so rook f2 is basically forced. Now we take the rook, take back. We take yes, so he, sorry. Yeah. So we take yeah, um, and white went on to, to win this game. Oh, sorry, black went on to win this game. They're already up material at this point. So. The important thing to understand is you play on the side of the board, you have more space, and you put your pieces to the side of the board to support what play you want. Black wanted to break on the king side to attack the king. White wanted to create a weakness on either d6 or somewhere on the queen side. So he has a target to win a pawn and break through on the queen side. In what position is in the famous queen side to lure the king? Yeah, I can, I can probably show a bunch of... Sorry, Silverbite is asking, in what position isn't the famous queen sack tactic to lure the king out in one of these positions? What if knight g5, knight e6? Okay, so the two questions asked were, what if we play knight g5, knight e6? Uh, one of the problems is the uh, knight's going to be captured and there's going to be a potentially weak pawn on e6. And regarding the other question for Silverbite, yeah, they probably I can probably show a famous game where there's a queen sacrifice. Uh, I think the queen set goes with rookie one. Yeah, okay, so yeah, the queen sex with rookie one. And this is the famous queen sec that uh, Silverbite wanna see. You sack the bishop, you sack the queen, you give this check. Oh, sorry, not the yeah, um, so yeah, you give this check, now the king has to come back, you give the check, king has to come back either way, but it doesn't matter, because you give this check, and then you mate on h3. Huh. Yeah, so this is, uh, I, I want to show this one, uh, because um, rook, um, yeah, because uh, taking is basically forced. Yeah, so the queen, uh, the famous line with the queen set goes with rookie one. Takes, sack the queen, check, check, and mate with the two knights. Okay, I'm not going into opening theory. I'm just uh, use this game to show you, you play on the side of the board, you have more space, so you guys can understand. Okay, uh, Vin Vin asks, oh, well, are there 20 move book moves? Are these 20? Uh, you mean, uh, is this uh, still booked by the move 20? Uh, I don't know if it's booked, but they are game examples from the position. So, I wouldn't necessarily say it's booked by move 20, but um, it's still game examples by move 20. Okay, so I'm going to show an example of a game of mine. So yeah, I was white. What do you think I played? Anyone? Anytime? 
probably easier for me to explain my games because I can understand my games a bit better. What do you guys think I played yet? Okay, so Sid says Bishop H7. Uh, Rook says Knight G5. LC0. Oh, I must close that. LC0 says Rook C1. And then there's a comment for H4 as well. Okay, so one out of the four of you got this correct. I'm going to explain now. So I'm just going to quickly... I'm going to quickly go over bishop h7, because this was first suggested by Sid. Um, so the problem is we're giving up a whole bishop, and it's hard to continue the attack now. Our opponent's position is coming quite quickly to the defense. So it's hard for me to really continue this attack. Okay, h4 was suggested. h4 is a decent idea, but um, black's next move is bishop b5 in most cases. And now we can't really move our bishop back. And if we exchange this bishop, which was quite a good bishop, now our opponent's going to play on the queen side quite quickly. And we've removed one of our pieces. Um, okay, what other move? Rook c1 was looked in. Yeah, again, uh, rook c1, bishop, uh, bishop b5. Um, remember what I said. You play on the side of the board, you have more space. e5. E5 gives white more space, so we play on the queen, uh, the king side. So rook c1 is to play on the queen side, but we don't have more space on the queen side. Our pieces belong on the king side. So I played the very strong knight g5. Now you'll see the idea now. So what do you think? Uh, h6 is forced because um, we are threatening the spawn twice now. And then I played this move. Knight h7. I'm attacking the rook. So if the rook moves away, then I get a file for my rook for free. I can move my rook up double. I can... So he would prefer to trade the rook. And now he played bishop b5 to try to trade off the bishop. What do you do now? How do you continue? You're white. EA, are you finally going to answer? Anyone can answer. What would you guys do now? I mean, Rookwood, what would you do? This is your line, no G5. Continue, continue. Continue with your idea, Rookwood. Or anyone. Okay, um, it's fine. I'm just going to continue. Uh, why can't we play bishop d7 after move knight g5? Okay, so I'm just going to briefly answer this question as well. The bishop's already on d7. What are you talking about? You want to know why we play bishop b5? I don't understand your question. Um, from d7 to h7? We play bishop h7. What's the idea of bishop h7? King h8, then one. It could be interesting, man. We just need to understand your idea. Okay, so I'll show you my idea so you guys can understand. So after trading rooks, bishop b5, I traded bishops, and then I played this move, knight f6. So if he moves away... First of all, uh, in the game they took, if he moves away, which is the, probably the best move, because uh, taking is going to be curtains for, for black, you'll see now. I'll probably play knight h5. 
and then I will play queen f4 and try to expand on the queen side. But yeah, uh, probably king h8 was one of the better moves. Actually, wait, wait why would I, play? I wouldn't play knight h5, sorry. Uh, let me just think, yeah, it's one of the better moves. Queen f4. Yeah, I think I would play queen f4 and then queen h5, try to attack on this side. So how the game continued, just to show you guys. So they took, I took back with the pawn. They played queen f7. Queen f8 is also losing. You got queen f8, I play this very strong rook f4 move. And the threat of rook g4 is very strong. They went uh, queen f7 and I took on h7. Just want to see the game here. Yeah, okay, then they went knight knight here to grab the pawn. To put more pressure on my pawn. And I went rook f3. This rook g3 check is very annoying. Queen h7 is basically forced, or else rook g3 is going to be just win. I went f7, king h8, f8 equals queen, knight takes f8, queen takes f8, rook takes f8, rook takes rook, queen takes rook, queen g8, trade queens. And I've got two connected pass pawns on the king side, and I won. There we go. That was a nice game. So the point to understand, if I go back to the start, I have more space on the king side. So I understood that my play is going to be directed towards the king side. And I continued with my king side attack. Okay, um, now, this is a very important concept to understand, the disadvantage of moving pawns. When we move a pawn, there's three disadvantages that could happen. Before I answer this question, can you guys name some of the disadvantages for moving a pawn? Maybe one of you will be correct. We can square, so that's sort of correct, yeah? Back rank. Uh, back rank is a bit of a weird answer, but okay. Can't come back. Yeah, Sid, Sid's got a good answer. Pawns don't move backwards. That's relevant. Anyone else? And then I'll explain now. I like Sid's answer the most so far. Could be target. Yeah, target. That's a good answer. Um, Silverbite is asking about the previous position. Uh, I just want to quickly go uh, answer Silverbite's question so I, can, so I can quickly do this. So Silverbite was asking on Queen F8, Rook F4. Uh, sorry, Rook F4. Isn't King F7 a, a good try? Okay, so I know. I know if I let the engine think here, but it's going to say it's plus five. But uh, if I switch on the engine, my computer gets slow. But uh, I, I'm just, I want to switch it on because I can't remember my analysis. Uh, let me check the analysis in the other term. So King F7. Oh, sorry, uh, trade, and then rook f4. So I just want to see. Uh, yeah, so queen e2 is a very strong response on king f7, coming in on the light squares. If you go queen g8 to stop me, rook g4, with rook g7 check coming, that's very annoying. Um, yeah, um, I just know it's about plus four when I check the engine on, on Queen of Federal Rocket 4. But uh, I, I can't let the engine think now, it makes my PC slow. Uh, 
Just give me one second here. Oh yeah, uh, you can. I'll I'll paste the FEN for that position so you guys can put it, switch it on with the engine if you want. You don't trust me hundred percent. There you go. There you go. So back. You can check that with the engine. Check check the rook f4 move, and you need to give the engine. Uh, no no no. Give the engine some time. Check the move rook f4. Because I know the engine starts saying equality, but I, I, I let it sit for a while. Um, okay, but anyway, uh, I don't want to get too much into analyzing uh, what's the engine defense. Uh, we don't play like engines. I just remember I did go over it in the game. Okay, let's uh, get back on track. So I said there's three issues when you move a pawn, and I'm going to go over them. Just want to get back here. Okay, so one reason is it creates a weakness. Show an opening here. So after, the, let me go here. I'm just going to show this one because I've shown this before. Okay, so here, here. I'm just quickly showing this before, just so I can show you show you guys briefly okay so when we played this e4 move the pluses to this e4 move is we gain space so we gain space in the center and we have more space to move our pieces the downside to playing e4 is now there's no longer a pawn that can protect the d4 pawn. So this e4 pawn has created, now there's a weakness on the d4 pawn. You can no longer protect this with a pawn, so now this pawn is a weakness. So one of the disadvantages to moving a pawn, it creates a weakness. I'm gonna add this note here. Uh, I'm trying to see who, who also mentioned that it can create a weakness. Was it Silverbite? Beacon Squares was mentioned by LC0. I think, uh, yeah, LCE0 mentioned it. Guys, I don't mind you chatting in the No Mic channel. It's just that I'm supposed to read everything you say uh, because there's a recording going on. So don't get too off topic if possible. Thank you. Okay, so one of the reasons was it creates a weakness. Okay, reason two is space left behind. So I'm going to show you another thing here so you guys can understand space left behind. So, oh, you're my mouse, sorry. So this is one of my openings. I play something called the Philidor with a D6 move order. And I'm going to show you there's this line knight g2. I'm not going to get into my opening theory. I'm just going to I'm showing you this one line. Okay, now in this position, I'm not going to get into opening theory, but I'm just explaining this position so you can understand. Black wants to play the move b5 to expand on the queen side. So white plays one of two moves. White ignores it and play bishop g2. White plays a4 to counteract the b5 move. When white plays a4, what is the issue with this move? What's the downside to playing a4? Yes, so LC0 is correct. He said weakens b4, and that's the exact reason. So after castle, bishop g2, black plays this move a5. The reason is, after castle, he wants to play knight a6 and plump his knight in on b4. Because now there's no a3 move from white, our knight can sit more comfortably on the b4 pawn. h3, knight b4. And the key thing, when our knight's on b4, we are supporting this d5 break. 
One thing I mentioned earlier, which I'm just going to mention again. Oh, someone left, but it's fine. Oh, I'll see you zero. Okay. Um, hopefully, it'll be a recording for you. That's fine. I think uh, Silverbait and some other guys are being active here. So one of the key things I mentioned is in the opening that you are going to study, one, you must understand where your pieces are going to be going. Two, you must understand the key break moves. So in this position, the key break move is d5 from uh, black. From black. So after the move, e takes d4, knight takes d4, or bishop takes. Bishop takes more common. Then we play d5. We play the center break in the center, uh, the central break move, and now we um. And now white no longer has more space in the center. So that was the disadvantage of this A4 move. Space left behind. Who can tell me what's the third disadvantage? Space left behind. It creates a weakness. Is there anything else? Okay, that's um, that's basically it creates a weakness. If your pawns could become too advanced and they start getting attacked, um, that falls into creates a weakness. So I'm going to fall that into the same category if they go too advanced and they become targets. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you guys the third point so you can... So yeah, create a weakness is a bit vague. Um, yeah, my, my bad. But uh, I'm trying to... Uh, this is a bit broad spectrum when I say there's three, because uh, I can go, when I say space left behind, I can show more broad examples. When I say create a weakness, I can say uh, far, far advanced pawn that can't be attacked. I can say uh, pawn. Um, yeah, the example I gave is because now we've played e4, now d4 can no longer be protected. This is basically exactly what you said. The pawn is ad uh, now too advanced, and we don't have other pawns to protect it. Yeah, it's basically that's what this one's about. Okay, so the third point is it creates something called a hook point. Now another another term for hook point would be a pawn lever. So when I say when I say pawn lever or hook, what would you guys understand by it? Okay, so I'm going to explain this term for you guys to understand because it's actually a very important strategical concept to understand because it's going to be a lot. So after the moves, I'm going to play a Sicilian dragon so I can explain this in a very easy way. It, yeah, it's to create an attack, but I'll explain you so you guys can understand. So I'm just going to play a dragon here quickly. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna explain this move. So the advantage to playing g6 is now we can develop our bishop on g7 and we have our bishop on this nice long diagonal. The disadvantage to playing g6 is now we've given our opponent a hook point. A hook point means a square our opponent can start targeting the pawn to force open lines. Normally it forces open the file or it can force open different lines on the board. So I've got many examples here, so you guys will understand this. The, the next, all the chapters are based on the, on hooks. So, um, just before I go over hooks, what what is a break move? What would you guys understand behind a break move? You guys should know what a break move is.
Yes, so that's very important. So a break move is a move to challenge your opponent's space. So after e4, c5, I'm, I'm going to play the Maroxy bind quickly so you guys can see. Uh, yeah. Just want to play out some moves here so I can show you guys. Okay, if you remember earlier, I said when you're studying your opening, it's a key to understand where your pieces belong and the break moves. So the break move is the move that challenges your opponent's space. So in this structure, where are the two break moves? For black. It's a move that challenges your opponent's space. So where's this break move? So B5 and D5. So uh, Silver Chain mentioned, Silver Bite mentioned B5, and the other break is D5. So this challenges our opponent's space in the center. So I'm just going to quickly import a game here from, from this opening so you guys can understand. So I'm going to move this to the right spot. Okay, just below big moves. Okay, there we go. So here's just a, a game so you guys can understand. Okay, so white has the more space at the center. When your opponent has more space, you need to come to attack it later. So find the key break moves. So it's d5, b5. So uh, black maneuvered their pieces to prepare for this central break. Okay, so yeah. Uh, the rook is supporting d5, the bishop, the knight, and we're going to play our central break move. We can't play b5 anymore, the queen side is locked. So we play our other break move. Uh, black went on to win uh, quite a nice game here. Um, if you want, you can go through the rest of the game. I'm just uh, briefly showing it to you there. But it's important to understand where your break move is. So the difference between a break move and a hook is a uh, welcome back LCE0. So the difference between a break move and a hook is a hook attaches onto a pawn to force open lines, while the break move is to challenge our opponent's space. So I just wanted to show this. Uh, okay, wait. actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to this one. I'm first gonna go over. So I'm gonna, let me just move this example of my game just a bit down. Just a bit down. I want it. I'll put it there. Put it there. Yeah. So now to get more back on hooks. Uh, let me see here. Okay, so here's a position. If you look at this position, uh, can you tell me all the hook points? So a hook is when you attach onto another pawn to open up lines. Normally files, it can open up a square for a knight. It can open up um, a rank, open up a diagonal for a bishop. All the hook points. G6 is a pawn, that's not a hook point. These are pawns, you need to find out the hook points. Okay, yes, h5, f5, e5 are all black's hook points, are white's hook points that they can utilize to open up lines. As for black, black's hook point is b4. As well. But d5 is a bit different. Remember I said, um, what is a break move? A break move is a move you play to challenge your opponent's space. So d5 can be a hook move. A break move can be a hook move. But d5 is more of a break move than, I would say, a move to 
attached to a pawn to force open lines. But yeah, a uh, break move and a hook move can be the same thing. But a hook move, you have to understand, is diff um, can be something else as well. Like, um, let's see. Okay, so a hook move for black is this, b4 point. So we attach onto the a3 pawn so we can force open lines on the king side. Okay, so I'm just going to show you this game so I can show you white used all their hook points to, uh, to attack. So white started out with h5, um, potentially opening the h file now since I've attached to the g6 pawn. Black played rook b8. Why did they play rook b8? To play b5, b4 attached to our a3 pawn. Why play queen f4? When your pawn has the pin piece, put more pressure on it. That's why they played queen f4. It also makes it harder to move the queen since now we win a piece completely. And black played, I think, I'm just trying to remember the game, I think rook e8. And then we exchanged here and played queen h4 to maybe threaten this. And then they played bishop f7 to make it harder to, for us to play e5. But we play e5 anyway. Because if they take with the pawn, we have a discovery with the, the rook. If they take with the piece, we take back with the piece. Again, they can't take with the pawn, they have to take with the rook. And now we use that third, that third hook point, f4, f5. We break up on g6. Rook comes back, f5. Um, the engine move is rook e5 here, yeah, and I'll show you why. So takes, bishop takes, and now rook a f1. When your opponent has a pin piece, put more pressure on it. This um, this g6 point is attacked three times now and practically can't be defended. The engine move suggests is to give up the exchange. If you try to defend it, there's several moves I can play. Uh, bishop c4, bishop f5, knight f5. Knight f5 is sort of a direct way to win material because I'm threatened to remove this guy. Um, and then potentially take here or check here. I could also just take the bishop and then take here and check you, yeah? So the engine suggests to take the exchange, then take on d3 and white's an exchange up. Uh, so what did you guys think of this uh, attack from white? Was it good? And the key to understand is we used our hook points, h5, e5, f5, all of them. to force open lines. Uh, no other questions? Okay, so now another important thing to understand with hooks is they can also create tactical opportunities. There's a lot of tactics that involve hooks. So if I go to this position, okay, um, I, this is a puzzle position. I'm just gonna give you the answer because I'll I don't have time for you guys to sit 30 minutes to try to solve this. But I'll, I'll give a breakdown of it so you guys can enjoy it a bit much. <laughs> I, I apologize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a breakdown of it. So in this position, this knight is pinned. Uh, like I said, we attack pinned pieces, so we would like to play queen f6 because that knight cannot really be protected. But the problem with queen f6 is white plays this in between with bishop takes f8. If we take the knight, another in-between move, take there. Take queen, take here, we down a rook. So if we go back, instead of playing queen f6, allowing the very strong counterattack, bishop takes f8, uh, black plays the very strong move, h5. h5 is a hook move, attaches to the uh, g4 pawn, and now white has no time to take on f4, on f8. Because we take on g5 and we're going to crash through on the king side. So white has to take this f4 pawn or something. If he takes with either the queen or the rook, the c3 knight's going to fall. If he takes with the bishop, remember when we played queen f6, there was this in-between move, um, taking the rook. Now there's no in-between move, so we play queen f6, we win the knight, we are piece up.
questions. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna show one more tactic so you guys can understand hook points. So this is a puzzle. I'll let you guys solve it this time because you guys should solve it quickly. Do you see the hook point? That's white to play. Now this is a Maroxy bind, but you guys should be able to solve it quickly now. Where's the hook point? Very strong one, C5. If, if he brings his queen back, we win a pawn. If he takes the pawn, we play this move F4. After he moves the knight, we play E5. We remove both defenders of the hanging bishop on, uh, on D7. Um, knight moves somewhere. Knight captures, capture back. Then we take the still capture threat in two pieces. So yes, c5, very strong break move. Always be aware of these hook points in your chess games, because it's it's a very important strategical concept. It's a very important tactical concept. Um, if I'll, I'll like mention some openings. So like in the Yugoslav attack in the Sicilian Dragon, it's important to play h4, h5, although because it's a theoretical battle, but important because our opponent has played this g6 move, I've created a hook point on h5, making the attack stronger. Okay, this is a, uh, I, I don't know why I called this test, but this is just another example that I just want to show you guys. So, no, I'm, I'm, I just want to show you this. Uh, don't worry, it's not a, not a puzzle, not a test. I don't know why I called it, called it then. So, I said there's three issues why we are uh, weaknesses when we move a pawn. One, it creates a weakness. Two, there's a space left behind. Three, it creates a hook point. So I'm just showing you this, because um, often with h6, uh, white takes the pawn. Because the h6 pawn no longer protects this g6 point. So we take and we bring in our queen. So this is just to understand when you move a pawn, there's space left behind that's no longer protected. Uh, just an example. And this is a very strong attack. The pawn is pinned, so after the king moves away, we can take back. We can move our queen back, we can check, we can grab there, can bring our knight in. It becomes a very strong attack. I'm not going to show you, but you guys can go over it if you want. I'll give you the F in if you guys want to uh, paste it in the, the mic channel. If you guys want to go over that. Fun tactic, um, but just not understand. So now let's go back. So yeah. So I should not add this up. Oh, Create a hook. Welcome. Joined. Oh, alt. Alti zero. Is that is that your alt account? Is it is it the same person? I can't tell. I don't know if it's the same person. Uh, it's probably someone else. Welcome, all these here. Okay, so I just want to show some examples now of my games uh, with break moves and ba basically using these three concepts. One, space left behind. Two, creates a weakness. Three, creates a hook. Most of my examples are going to be based on the hook. Yeah, I, I don't think Aldi Zero is going to find my lecture instructive. Well, not this one. Well, this one is uh, a bit more instructive than my last one. I'll focus on the lecture. Okay, so here's just some examples of me using hook points during my game. So my opponent played b5. So what did I play? I'm white here. I 
Okay, um, I'm actually going to go through this a bit faster because I'm seeing the time. I've used quite a bit of time, actually. It's, got, it's just over the hour mark now. Okay, so I played this break move e5, breaking in the center of the board. So I'm threatening to take there and push on the e file. So it took here. I took back. Queen d8. And then I played queen f3. I'm in some positions threatening to take there because of the pin on the over there. My opponent played bishop b7. Now I could take here, but I played a different move. In this position, I took on f6. Wait, did I take first? Yeah. Yeah, I took on f6. I took on f6, and then I took on e8. I applied queen f5. Uh, the point of queen f5 is it's awkward to play g6 because your bishop's hanging. So so my opponent... Um, let me just check what, what my opponent did. Okay, uh, my opponent... Uh, my opponent took the knight, and I played check. Check, and I play at rook e1, and they resigned. And I won the queen. That's how the game ended. And the key for me activating my pieces was this e5 break move. Then I brought in all my pieces. You see I have my knight, my bishop, my rook, everything of mine is busy attacking. And my opponent's weaknesses in their position. All being activated because of the e5 break. Um, okay, uh... So here's another example of one of my games. So in this position, I traded on e7, and I played this f6 move. This f6 move creates a hook onto this G, oh, sorry, creates a hook onto the g7 pawn. So after my opponent moves the queen or takes the pawn, I create weaknesses on the queen side. I can bring in my rook, can bring in my bishop, and continue the attack. I'm just going through this quickly so you guys can understand the hook move that I played, which creates a advantage for me. Uh, okay, so here's another one. Uh, this is actually a bit more difficult. Uh, I just want to move this one chapter down, so I'll go through that last. Okay, so this is a game uh, I played. So, okay, I'm going to go through these two because these are the two fun ones. So my opponent played this move a5. On, on the move a5, what do you do as white? What would you do here as white? After your opponent has played a5. What would you guys do? So black has just played a5. You're in this position. You're white. What would you do? Uh, pawn to c5, um, you'll give up a pawn. Uh, the d5 pawn will be attacked three times, you know? So c5 does give up a pawn. Anyone else? Suggestions? Uh, where are we observing this? Uh, in the study. I'll show the study again. There we go. Study. So Aldi there, you can also answer. You're the stronger player, so maybe you can answer this. Take on g7, queen g6. I don't know how the queen's going to land on g6, Sid. That's a bit strange, but uh, take on g7 is definitely an idea. Wouldn't break the tension so quickly, because uh, when you trade off, it makes it easier for the opponent to defend. Uh, Aldi zero, maybe if you can see the position in the study. Make sure you synced with me. Um, what would you play there? Mm, I would be interested in all these zeros on. So. Anyone else? The reason I want to understand is I want to see your guys' thought process a bit. Might be fine. But weird. I was thinking h4, h5. h4, h5 is definitely an idea, but do you want to keep your king in the center? Where do you want your king if you want to play h4, h5? Okay, so yes. Um, so 
opponent played a5, so you play long castle, is that correct? After your opponent has played a5? Yes, okay. So, yes, so that was what I played in the game, uh, Queenside Castle. It's important to understand um, the reason I'm showing... <laughs> yes, no, it's a, it's a good move. But the reason I'm showing you is this, because some people, when I say I have castle queenside, yes, yeah, is, but your opponent is attacking on the queen side with this a5, a4 move. Um, now, I ask the question, is what black attacking on the queen side with pushing the a pawn? You've got a4, a3. That's key to understand. After I castle queen side, my opponent did play a4, which was a bit of a weird move. And uh, so I just want to find the game here. Okay, so my opponent played a4, uh, which was a bit of a weird move. Yeah, so yeah, so it's a bit of a weird move because my opponent's not threatening anything on the queen side. Sorry, thanks for the lesson. I have to leave. My battery's for four percent. Okay, bye bye. EA, uh, I'm sure it'll be uploaded to YouTube. Not too much longer. I think I'll only need forty minutes, thirty minutes. Okay, so why I wanted to explain a4, a5. This expansion doesn't make sense because I can close down the queen side. It's actually very. In it's sometimes very important to hold this tension. The reason I hold the tension on the h6 point is because if I move the bishop back, uh, then potentially, or when I play this h4, h5 break, my opponent has option to close down the queen side. But when you hold this break, you're going to hold the h7 point, so it's not going to move forward. So that's why a lot, a lot of times you keep the bishop on h6 if you can. Uh, bringing the bishop back is also an option, but I, I like keeping the tension there. It depends on your style. But uh, generally, I keep the bishop, keep the tension. So, yeah, after a4, there's no threat on the queen side. So, if my opponent plays a3, I play b3. So, this is something that I wanted to say a pseudo threat. Sometimes uh, in a chess position, you can be scared of what your opponent's going to be doing, but what they're doing is not really a threat. White's not going to attack the queen side, we're going to lock it down. Our threat on the king side is more realistic. A4, I just played h4. I continue with my attack to open the king side. Now my opponent plays c6. My opponent should have played c6 one move ago. Counterattack the center. This was the correct idea. Because the, this is the key point in the position. But now because my opponent's played one move late, now I get h5. My opponent doesn't have time to take on d5 in this position. I attack very quickly. Takes d5, takes g6, takes g7, green h6, my attack comes instantly. So black has to play a defensive move, and they played rook f7 in the game. So the point is, if I take, they take on g7. Oh, sorry. Sorry, bad error. Take and take on g7, and then they can run with their king. So I, so now I took on g6, uh, they took with the pawn. Uh, if they take with the knight, uh, then I can take eventually, and then the h7 pawn is very weak. They took with the pawn. I took on g7, they take with the rook, they have to take with the rook, they take with the king, my queen comes in again. And now I played queen h6. I'm threatening to check and grab the queen. So they played queen c7. And now I played the move knight e6. I'm forking these two pieces, so my opponent only has one reply. Bishop e6, pawn e6, taking away the f7 pawn, so I'm threatening a mate in one. So you play king f8. And now uh, I'm quite happy with the move I played now. I played the move queen e3. I move the queen out of the way so the rook can give check, but also I want to sneak in to the central dark squares of the board. With queen e3. So my opponent played uh, c5. They wanted to control the central dark squares. They were quite scared. Um, this was one of the lines I analyzed if you guys are interested. Rook d8, rook h8, knight f8, queen c5. On queen c5, the only move is uh, rook e7. You can't play queen e7 because I take the rook with check because your queen's been. And then I take the rook and I play queen e5. 
13 and my 18 1. So you have to play rook g7 only move. And now I play g4, breaking through here, queen g5, king b1. And funny enough, the position is practically Zuxwan for black. It's hard to move. You can't move anything. And I'm also threatening there, amongst other threats here. But how the game actually continued, just to show you, they played c5, which although stopped my ideas with queen c5. And now, um, remember, when your opponent moves a pawn, it's a, creates a weakness, b, space left behind, c, creates a hook point. So there's space left behind, b5, I play knight b5. Hitting the, uh, hitting the queen, queen c8, and I played rook d6. Although I'm attacking the knight, the keys, I'm, uh, oh, sorry, 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 uh, I'm missing a move here. So after c5, I first played the check. Uh, um, don't forget the check. And then, uh, and then I played knight b8. And knight b5, queen c8. And I played rook d6. Although I'm attacking the knight, I'm also protecting my pawn, which is quite important. They played, uh, sorry, they played rook a6 to protect the knight. And I played queen c3. My queen coming into f6 is uh, almost unstoppable. Uh, they played knight d5. I took the knight. They took, uh, sorry, my, my mouse keeps making other moves. They took my rook. I played check, king, king here, mate. And that's how I finished my attack. So if we go back to the start, castle, and I showed you the rest of the game. You like the game? Interesting? Show you. That's too deep. Well, just appreciate the game, not the analysis. That was an over the board game, by the way, if you guys were interested. Here's another one. Um, just want to see what I did in this one. Okay, I sort of remember what I did, but I just want to see if I have the link to this game. Okay, you guys are white here. Anyone can answer. What would you do? It would be nice if the national monster answers. I'll be zero. Um, anyone? What would you do as white? It's from one of my games, so I'd be interested. Might have three. Knight of three is interesting, but not what I did. Okay, uh, can you explain knight of three? I'll explain what I did. F4. F4 seems a bit risky. Oh, F4 does. When you move a pawn, be careful of space left behind. So F4. Now this diagonal can potentially become a bit weak. Ah, there, I found the game. Uh, I was looking for the game, that's why I was delaying you guys were asking us, asking you what I did. Okay, uh, so let me actually show you what I did. So you guys, and then I'll explain it in more details. So. Uh, Ald uh, Zero had a good idea with the move knight f3. I played a slightly different move, but his move's fine. So he wants to move this knight away, so I can put more pressure on this d6 point. The d6 point's a bit weak. I either play knight f3 
or the move I played, which is slightly stronger because there's a second idea behind it, the move knight b3. So the reason I play knight b3 is because I want to pressurize this pawn, but also I'm going to play bishop f4, and then my knight can sit on the c5 point because there's going to be a pin on the pawn. Uh, okay, yeah, I found the game. So my opponent played. Uh, my opponent played bishop a8 to open his rook. I played bishop f4, pressurizing the d6 pawn. It's now being attacked three times, by the way. So I'm basically threatening to grab the pawn. Yeah, bishop f4 is a very nice move. My opponent played the move bishop e5. And then I took, and I plumped my knight on the nice c5 square. So this was the advantage of playing knight b3 of a knight f3, is I get a nice knight on c5. Knight f3, yeah, so knight f3 was controlling the bishop coming to e5, but I wasn't really scared of the bishop coming to e5, because my, my idea of knight b3 is to play knight c5, another idea. But knight f3 is a... Uh, Knight 3 is a very logical move. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the game, but I'm going to link the game there in the chat. So you can click there. There's a link uh, in the study to the game. You can just click. You can look at it if you want. You can see I played a decent game there. Okay, so then I went on to win this game because of my quite strong knight on c5. So yeah. Uh, so the key was to understand the weakness on d6. Okay, this was a request from LCE0. They wanted me to explain the Benoni. Now, the reason I avoided explaining openings is because I only have really experience with the opening experience with the openings that I play. So I can explain my repertoire with e4. I can explain what I do against e4, against d4, but I'm not a d4 player, so explaining the knight b3, uh, knight e5, what was the attack? Oh, but uh, didn't I show that uh, I'll d0 in the game? Bishop e5, when they went knight e5, bishop e5 happened in the game, then I traded on e5 and I went knight c5. I'll link the game for you so you can see even. Link it in the no make channel. Oh, what, what, what's with the broken link? Uh, my, my apologies, let me get a better link for you. There you go. Yeah, that was after bishop f4, because I was taking three times. So after bishop f4... Uh, oh, bishop... Yeah, I agree with you, bishop a8 is a bit of a weird move. Okay, so your question is... Let me actually cover that quickly. So instead of bishop a8, which is a bit of weird, what if we played here? Um, okay, there's a couple ideas here. I think I would have gone knight a4 to go knight c4 to hit the bishop on e5. So I use the... Yeah. Oh, I, could, uh, I think I also had an idea of playing f4. I'm trying to remember. f4. Um, to remove the defender of the d6 pawn. Yeah, but uh, I agree with you, bishop a8 was a weird move. Uh, but my intention of playing knight b3 was because I thought my knight can use, uh, utilize the queen side space a bit better. So ideas for knight a4, knight c4, or playing f4 and then targeting d6 some more. But yeah, bishop a8 is a weird move, I agree with you. Ah, uh, yeah, that was my at first glance. Now three avoid uh, bishop e5, my f4, now f5, c4 is good. Yeah, the bishop, uh, although it defends all the squares, it's a bit awkward still on the e5 point. Okay, um, I just want to quickly cover this. So, I'll see you. I'll see request was me to cover the Benoni. So, I'm not. 
Uh, I'm not very familiar with openings that I don't actually study, but I'll try to give you guys a brief glance because I looked over this a little bit. So when you guys study the opening, I remember, remember I said there's two things. One, understand where your pieces belong. Two, understand the key break moves. So let me go through the Benoni quickly. Okay, so I'm going to go through a more easier line. Okay, so before I go through the next moves, I just want to explain this position a bit so you guys can understand. White has more space on the center, thanks to the d5 pawn, and the queen side, because this pawn's on the queen side. Um, black has more space on the queen side, thanks to the c5 pawn, but also because white's now pawns are all on the central light squares, this diagonal is very juicy for the bishop. Uh, the g7, the a1, h8 diagonal. So the strategic goal for white is normally to uh, expand either in the center and then slow down the queen side play or to utilize this d6 pawn, which is in a lot of lines quite weak. So the main move here is bishop f4. The bishop's uh, quite nicely placed because it's already putting pressure on uh, d6. And now in some lines, we can go queen d2. a6, whenever they go a6, you go a4, you prevent b5. Bishop g7 on the last long angle. So we got h3. So our opponent can't play knight h5 to trap the bishop. There's quite a few ideas white can play. White doesn't have to go bishop f4. There's e4 uh, to play the most sharp line. There's a g3 system where you put your bishop on this nice diagonal where you defend d5, and then your knight goes to d2 to c4, and then sometimes you trade off the knight, uh, the bishop. Uh, but I'm just showing you, this is actually, I think, the most popular line at the moment, uh, bishop f4. Uh, castle, e3, queen e7. So black's, black has two ideas. Black's first idea is to uh, trade off uh, minor pieces so that their d6 pawn can't just be targeted because white normally wants to target the spawn and win the pawn. So black tries to hold the e5 point so the d6 point isn't as weak. And then after that, they try to expand on the queen side with everything they can. Bishop e2, knight bd7, castle. And now 98. The idea of 98 is to both come on the queen side, support b5, and like I said, control the e5 point. Put, a, put something on e5, knight d2. Put your pieces on the side of the board, you have more space. d5 means more space on the queen side. Knight e5, bishop h2. We'll get our bishop out the way so we can play f4. f5, queen c2, uh, rook b8. Rook a e1 and I have six f4 and I have seven and a5 to slow down the b5 move. So there's a couple ideas for white or black. This, this opening the Benoni is very, very dynamic. White can play for a lot of different ideas, black can play for a lot of different ideas. But as long as you understand the strategical ideas, I think you'll be able to understand ideas behind what you're supposed to be doing. So like I said, uh, black tries to put a knight or a p hold the e5 square so that uh, his d6 pawn is not too weak. Then they try to expand on the queen side. It looks like c, uh, b5 or c4. White tries to utilize that weak d6 pawn. Uh, either tries to expand in the center uh, with e5 or use the extra space thanks to the d5 pawn to find good squares for their pieces. Yeah, knight, d, uh, knight d2. Yeah, knight d2 is quite a multi-purpose move. Uh, knight d2 hopes to put our knight on c4 in some lines, but it also holds this e4 point. So we can go bishop f3 in some lines, we can go pawn to f e4 in some lines. It's quite a multi-purpose move. Uh, also, black wants to trade off pieces from knight e5. So when you have more space, it's usually a good idea to avoid trades. 
Okay. Um, I just uh, just for the fun of it, I'm going to show you the most sharp line uh, out of the Manoni that I looked at briefly, which is to go e4, f4 quickly. So e4, g6, f4, bishop g7, and now the very fun bishop b5. So we play this bishop b5 move. So our opponent's going to put something on d7, and we can support e5. If we go e5 right away, the problem is this pawn is very weak. So we play bishop e5 first. So when you go e5, we're um, going to immediate pressure. Um, our opponent can't attack our pawn so quickly. So this move would already be a blunder, because e5 is so strong. And now both e6 is strong, or just knight f3. And we support our center very well. So the move that's forced is knight fd7. We have to stop e5. And now a4 uh, to slow down the a6 b5 break. Castle, knight f3. Okay, now remember I said there's three weaknesses when you move a pawn. One, it creates a weakness. Two, it creates a hook point. Three space left behind. So a4 weakens b4. So the main movie has knight a6. Castle and knight b4. Taking advantage of the space left behind. Rook e1. a6. Bishop f1. Rook e8. And now h3. h3 is a bit difficult to understand, but I'll explain it briefly. So the reason we play h3 is because if we play with like bishop e3, black plays knight f6. And when we play bishop f2, they play knight g4. And the capture on here is very annoying to meet. So we play h3 as a prophylaxis move against this knight f5, knight g4 idea. And then f5, uh, bishop d2, and actually, yeah, so bishop d2, and it sort of continues as a dynamic game. I don't want to go over it that deeply. But uh, yeah, so this is um, so this is some of the ideas in the Benoni. I'll see E zero. I hope I showed you some of the ideas. I just went through it briefly. Uh, it looks like quite a fun opening from both white and black. But normally it feels that white pushes a bit more. Okay. Um. So now the. While I still have time, I'm going to go over one more thing. This is off topic for the chapter. This is not based on pawns. This is based on something called scope and influence. So a scope is the range a piece can move, sort of without being captured. So this this bishop here has a scope of three. Uh, sorry, has a scope of three squares. Um, So the scope is the range the piece can move to. So when your opponent's pieces have little scope, um, they can get trapped. Uh, that's a tactic to understand in a chess position. So I'm going to show you the next two positions where we trap our opponent's position, our opponent's pieces, because they have little scope. So this is a uh, position from one of my games. If you notice, our opponent's knight um, ha on c4 has little scope. It can't come forward anyway because we control all the forward positions. So the only square this knight can go to is b5. But uh, at the same time, this queen, if it doesn't go back, it has no squares going forward. So in this position, I played this move b4. I uh, sorry, I didn't play b4. I played the move b3. So the point of b3 is that this knight, I'm forcing this knight to move somewhere. If the knight comes back to b6, I play b4 and the queen's trapped. If the knight takes an a4, I play b4 and the queen must go somewhere where it's not protecting the knight, because all the uh, all the other points are, the points along this diagonal are protected and the pawn's protected, and I grab the knight. So he has to play queen takes a4. Now I could take the knight, but um, but these pawns are a bit annoying. So I play a little in between move before I take the knight. I played rook a1, and then the queen moves, and then I took the knight. 
And now um, I won a piece, thanks to the combination of understanding the scope of my opponent's pieces. Uh, just one more for you guys, so you can cement it. Um, Black's queen on d8 has very little scope. It's basically trapped already. So uh, the strongest move here is uh, e6, but I played them over rook takes f7. The idea is after rook takes f7, knight e6, the queen is trapped. And um, that's how the game continued and I went on to win. The best move here is actually bishop d5 to control this move. That's why e6 was the best move in this position. I'm going through this a bit quickly, but um, just to briefly, I'm just briefly explaining this. Uh, first knight takes f7, then knight g5, e6. Uh, what position are you talking about? All d0, this position. Knight, uh, knight take. You want to go? Knight takes f7. You want you want to take on f7 with the knight, but knight e6 wins the queen. Oh, you, oh, you wanna, oh, you wanna do this? Oh, you wanna bring the other knight in? Okay, uh, that's also awesome an idea. Let me, let me just. Yeah, um, problem is, th that's also an idea, but I think after you, you take heal, you'll take the chance to bring the queen out. Uh, and the difference is, if you don't play 96, I think he tries to bring the queen on. But it's it's true. Uh, I think this can be played anyway, because it's a lot of material. You grab a whole rook. So this one I have a knight, four queen. The other one I have a, a whole rook. Anyway, it's important to understand the position of taking advantage of the trapped queen on d8. That's the point of this. So now I'm going to go back to this. So the scope of the pieces is the range they can move to if they have a little scope. They're either out of play on the board or um, they can be trapped sometimes. So now I'm going to explain influence. So influence is the pieces pressure on the opponent's side of the board. Imagine there's a line here between the fourth and the fifth rank. This line separates your side of the board to your opponent's side of the board. Which pieces of white and which pieces of black has the most influence on the opponent's side of the board? I'll give you guys some seconds. It should be easy to answer this. Which piece has the most? Okay. Um, knight is correct. Misspelled though as a K. Yes, knight. So the knight on c4 has the most influence in black session. Uh, goodbye, someone. So it has influence on four squares. If you look at any other of white's, white's pieces, no other piece has more influence on the black side. The queen doesn't, the rook, the bishop, the other knight, the bishop. So our that, that would be our best piece at the moment because that piece currently has the most influence on our opponent's side of the board. And if we look, the black knight on f4 has the most influence on our side of the board. So I took that black knight. I removed the piece that had the most influence in my opponent's side of the board. Yeah, uh, this is my game, by the way. Sorry, I didn't mention that. And then after I took, I played the... Uh, what break? Hook move e5. So I forced open lines now in the center. Yes, I played e5. He took, and then I played d6, queen d8. I think I took this way, but it's much better to take with this knight. Uh, because now I'm threatening d7. And if you go knight d7, um, there's a tactic that uh, I would be amazed if you guys would see. Uh, what would you guys play as white? I'll, I'll d0. This is basically a puzzle. What would you do? Now... It's not bishop basics. Why bishop basics? Why why are you suggesting that? You trolling? Oh, you you want oh you want ninety seven ninety ninety six? Oh, you want ninety six of ninety seven? Uh, it's actually interesting. It's interesting. Okay, so the the move is knight takes f seven.
the, the very strong move knight takes f7. Taking with the king feels a bit suicide because uh, the king has to come up to the board and get checkmated quickly in two moves. So you have to take with the rook. It is very strong. Bishop c4. Why this is so strong is because this is a pin that you're not going to get out of. So. Um, uh, let me just see. So if you play king f8, uh, queen d... Oh, sorry, no. I'm trying... My mouse slips all the time. That's why I can't play bullet. So queen d5, and this f7 point you can't break. Play queen f6, then rook e7. Even though the... Even though the f7 point isn't pinned, the pressure on f7 is unbearable. So the main move here is to play bishop f6 to stop knight g5. I will play queen d5, more pressure on f7, queen f8 defending the rook. And now rook e7 is a very strong move that's winning here. One much easier move is knight g5, or seen a capture. And next move we're just going to follow up with rook e7 and pressure our opponent a lot. Okay. Uh, I, of course, in the game didn't find uh, knight takes f7. I'm just showing an engine continuation because I found it quite fascinating what the engine continued. Um, okay, so this is the last example and the last thing in this that I'm going to show you guys. And then we finish with the whole study. So I was white here. I want you to guys to guess what I played. It's white to play here. What would you play as white? The last move was some uh, queen takes f6 from one of these two squares. Now, what would you do? What would you do here? Uh, let's see. Queen g3. Yes, queen g3. Ah, that's very nice. Very nice. No, no, queen g3 is uh, this is not a tactical position. So yes, um, there's no tactic with bishop g3, uh, with uh, bishop c6. This is a very positional thing that I'm going to show you guys, so don't, don't worry about looking for tactical sequences. So queen g3, this is the exact move I played. The queen's very well placed on g3. It puts influence on quite a bit of uh, uh, points on the black side of the board. You see that on queen g3? So queen g3 is uh, what I played as well. And then, let me just, I'm going to check what my weapon played here. Sorry, I'm just double checking the game. Because I, I can't remember it that well. Okay, I found the game there. So yeah, my opponent after queen g3, um, my opponent was scared of this move bishop g5, which is trapping their queen. Uh, so they played the move bishop e7, stopping my idea of bishop g5. Now what do you do? Queen c7, oh nice. Uh, I'm in a very strong play, I will guess my moves quickly. I did not play queen g7, though. No. I did not play queen c7. But queen c7 is a nice idea. Um, I played a different move, and then I played queen c7. Oh. h4 before playing queen c7. h4 again threatens this move to trap the queen. So my opponent played h6, and then I played queen c7. Now my opponent played rook b8 to defend the pawn. Guess what I did now? B8. 
bishop f4. Uh, bishop f4, but where d5 is interesting. G4 is interesting. Okay, um, this is a bit unfair because you guys probably wouldn't understand my move. Okay, um, I played the move king b1. Always playing me one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually had a, a deeper idea than just uh, always playing me one. Uh, in a lot of positions, I want to play bishop g5 and take back with the pawn where the queen will be trapped. Um, but the problem is, I don't want him to have a tempo check on this square in some some positions. Uh, killing me? Why, why are you being killed? So the idea is to go bishop g5, takes takes. Um, and so I, I'm threatening the queen, and then he doesn't take back and have a check. And then I'm also threatening the rook. So uh, let me give an example. So say he plays a nothing move. I play bishop g5, takes, takes. If he trades rooks, I just take rook. If he takes back, the check here is uh, sometimes very deadly. Not not in this exact position, but this is this is why I played King B one. So he doesn't take on the square with check. That was that was my main idea. It's also good to play King B one in a lot of these positions, but I wanted my king to be out of this diagonal. And if you put on stockfish, stockfish says King B one's the best move as well, so I'm proud of my King B one move. After king b1, uh, my opponent played bishop d8 because he hated my queen being in his face. I played queen g3. Uh, my opponent played bishop e7, thinking I'll, I'll be an idiot and repeat the position. What did I do now? I didn't play bishop g5. I didn't play c4. I didn't play a4, no. I'm surprised you guys aren't seeing this because white just wins right away in this position. I played bishop f4, attacking the rook. The rook had to move, and I played bishop e5, trapping the queen. Bishop f4, tempo on rook, rook c8, bishop e5, trade e5, queen's trapped. And I won the game. My opponent resigned. Okay, there we go. Um, I've done the whole thing, but I'm just going to review everything so you guys can understand. So... For the opening, uh, two opening principles to understand is you either, um, for the classical style, aim to control your own space in the center, or the hypermon style, aim to give your opponent the center and attack it later. Um, two important things to understand when you are studying the opening is to understand where your pieces go and to understand the break moves in the position. So the break move is what you'll do to challenge your opponent's space. Um, for the direction, um, so when you when you are aiming and you get a space advantage, remember you put your pieces on the side of the board, you have more space. So if you have a pawn e5, generally you play on the king side because your pawn e5 gives you more space. If you remember the game I showed you. Um, sorry, I just want to go to my game. You remember this game I showed you? So I, I had more space on the king side, thanks to e5. So I played on the king side with a king side attack with knight g5. Uh, review the three, the three weaknesses when you make a pawn move. One, there's space left behind. Two, it creates a weakness that you can target. Three, it creates a hook point that you can attach to to force open lines. 
Um, and then the last thing was regarding influence and space. So influence and scope. So the scope is the range the opponent's the piece can move. So if a piece has little scope, then it can be trapped or it will be out of play. Um, and the influence is the amount of pressure you put on your opponent's side of the board. The more influence the pieces have, um, the more annoying they get. So if we go back, sorry, just briefly explaining this last position, queen c7 was to put our opponent, our queen, in a position where it puts even more influence on the opponent's side of the position. Queen G, f g3 was to put a position where our queen was on more influence on the opponent's side of the position. So influence is the amount of pressure on the opponent's side of the board. I mean, there's an imaginary line in the center. And scope, uh, the range the piece can move to. OK, I reviewed everything. Any questions? That should be everything. Any questions at all? It went just, I think I kept it just around two hours because this was quarter past and now it's eight past. Uh, so I kept it just under two hours. Uh, Queen C7, sorry, what's this question uh, Sid is asking? Queen c7 castle, uh, but the, uh, I take the pawn. And the reason they played rook b8 was because I'm threatening in a pawn. And the knight hangs as well, so uh, that's number two. <laughs> yeah, the, sorry, I would, I would grab the knight, but uh, for, for one, I played there because I was attacking the pawn. Uh, but the knight hangs, of course, sorry. Yeah, uh, if they play castle, I'll just grab, I'll grab a knight. My bad. Oh. Uh, so any questions regarding the whole study? You guys found it instructive? Uh, yep. Nope. Thank you. Seems like everyone's fine. Fifty uh, fifty points to Gryffindor. Uh, searching for Bobby Fisher. Oh, <laughs> you're talking about the uh, the master points that uh, what's that guy's name? I got his name that he kept giving to uh, the student. Get fifty master points. Do I get my certificate yet? Yeah, uh, Pandolfini. That was his name from the movie Searching for Bobby Fisher. Two one fifty two. All to go. Uh, you should check out the film. It's at least decent to watch once. Although it feels that it hasn't aged that well if you watch it today. That's what uh, that's what I got from rewatching the movie. It hasn't aged that well. Um Okay, uh for n just briefly uh, to say for next week I uh, just want to mention, so this week I haven't really covered pawn structure. If you notice, I was more on what to do with your pawns, uh, more than covering pawn structure. Um, next week I'm going to see if I can cover more pawn structures, because uh, it's actually important to understand double pawns, um, backwards pawns. So I, I, I'm going to see if how I can cover uh, pawn structure more next week. Uh, okay, I see LC0 so, uh, just posting something that's unrelated. So I think I'm going to end it here. Uh, no more questions. Uh, Rook, uh, I think you can end. It's finished now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming.